Okay, so um, welcome everybody and thanks for having me um, talk to you today. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about restoring flower rich landscapes in the working landscape of Ranskin Farm, which has been Plant Life's flagship nature reserve since 2005. Uh, it's a site that is owned in part by Plant Life and in part by the local authority, Medway Council, but managed by Plant Life in partnership with our tenant farmer whose family has actually been farming at Ranscombe since the 1970s. Now, for those of you who don't know us, who don't know Plant Life, uh, I'll just give you the, the standard line on this because it's going to do it far better than, uh, <laughs> than I can. Uh, plant Life is the international conservation charity working to secure a world rich in wild plants and fungi. Founded in 1989, Plant Life has 15,000 members and supporters. While plants and fungi are the foundation of all life on earth, plant life enhances, restores, protects and celebrates our natural heritage through working with landowners, other conservation organisations, public and private bodies and the wider public. And plant life owns 23 nature reserves covering nearly 4,500 acres across England, Scotland and Wales. We were instrumental in the creation of the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, the Important Plant Area Network, and we are a member of Plant Europa, a pan-European network of over 60 wild plant conservation organisations. We were governed by a our board of 12 trustees and have around 70 staff located across the UK. We also support a team of 1,500 volunteers work in the field, at events and in our offices. And our patron is the former Prince of Wales. A registered charity, Plant Life is funded by donations from its members and supporters through grants and charitable trusts and through its pioneering land management advice and projects. So as a charitable organisation working for nature conservation, um, not similar in many ways to the RSPB, only obviously a tad smaller, um, but we work a lot with the RSPB uh, in partnership. Um, and just as another quick thing, some of our, um, some of our campaigns, for example, one of our major campaigns at the minute, No Mow May, which is the name suggests has been running the last few years and encourages people with gardens and lawns to avoid mowing them for at least a month in order to give wildflowers and nature much needed space to thrive. So if you have time, if you haven't before, because some of you may already be members or or may already know about this anyway, but um, if not, then uh, if you have time, then please do check out our website and see what we've got going on. Um, about me, well, um, as you know, uh, my name is Ben, and I've, uh, I've been actually working at Branscom since 2008, so I'm actually in my 15th year now. Uh, prior to this job, I was working at a site immediately adjacent to Branscom, so I've known the site, the immediate geographical area. Since, um, since 2004, uh, seeing all the main many changes that have taken place here over the years. Um, now, as people may be watching this potentially all over the UK, um, they may not know, probably don't know the site at all. Uh, I'll just show you this uh, Ransom's location, which is in um, southeast England in the north of the county of Kent, and approximately 20 to 25 miles from central London. Uh, and here is a more local view um, showing the boundary of the reserve in yellow and its proximity to the settlements of Medway and Grays End. Um, and as I'm sure you know, it's a very highly, it's a very densely populated area and very busy area with the A2 and M2 up to London and the high speed rail link um, down to the continent running parallel. Um, but it's also an area of great importance for nature conservation. Uh, and to the north and east, mostly out of shock. I have shot. Uh, you'll have uh, North Kent marshes on the Thames, Medway and Swale estuaries, which I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, which of course is very important for their migrating bird populations. Um, but Ranscombe itself is situated almost at the northern tip of the North Downs, uh, above the Medway Valley. The North Downs, of course, being a range of chalk hills stretching from Surrey in the west down to the White Crest of Dover on the coast in the east. Um, so situated on the North Downs, Ranscombe is 252 hectare, or if you prefer, 620 acre site. And approximately half of that is woodland and half agricultural land. Uh, and the majority of that agricultural land has largely over the past century been managed as arable for growing crops. So our tenant farmer grows a range of commercial crops that typically include wheat, barley, beans, rape, and linseed. Um, now, this tradition of arable farming is absolutely critical to the site's value for wild plant conservation, as the reserve is regarded as probably the most important site for arable plants in the whole UK. And there is a huge assemblage of arable plant species here, some of which have had their, they've got their largest UK populations at Ranscombe. Um, 
So what do we mean when we say arable plants? Well, first of all, these plants are all what we would term archaeophytes, uh, which means they were first introduced to the UK before the year 1500. But for the most part, probably arrived, most certainly by accident, with the introduction of food crops such as wheat and barley from the Middle East by mainland Europe around four to 5,000 years ago. So they're not truly what we regard as native species, but they are very much part of our countryside and now form an important part of our ecosystem. They provide an essential source of pollen and nectar for bees, butterflies and other pollinators, and their seeds can support huge populations of small mammals and farmland and birds. And secondly, these plants are all annuals, so they last only one year, typically setting seed at the end of the summer after they've flowered, then new plants emerging that autumn or the following spring. The life cycle is closely linked to the farming year, traditionally growing alongside the crops that came into this country with. The plants flower throughout the spring and the summer as the crop is growing, they set seed before the crop is harvested, then that seed is turned back into the soil as the ground is ploughed and harrowed before sowing next year's crop. Now, if the ground wasn't disturbed each year, then other more competitive perennial plants, these grasses would establish, and the much more specialist annuals would lose the bare soil habitat that they require. However, these arable plants have experienced severe declines and now make up one of the most threatened groups of plants in the UK. So greater intensification of agriculture since the middle of the last century has included, of course, the use of powerful chemical herbicides that kill off many of the plants directly and more effective fertilisers that help enhance the growth of already more vigorous crop varieties uh, and which leaves little or no space for arable plants to thrive. And the result is that many of these plants have disappeared from the farm landscape altogether. So if we look now at just a handful of the rare arable plants that we have at Ranscombe, um, first off what we've got here um, is narrow fruited corn salad, which is a species that has undergone substantial declines over the past half century across the UK, but with the North Downs still an important area for this plant. It's rated uh, as endangered in the UK, which is the second highest level of conservation concern. Um, corn cockle, this was a plant that was very common up to the end of the 19th century, and though it remains widely available in wildflower seed mixes, this is believed to have become, well, it was, this was become extinct in the wild until it re-emerged at Ranscombe one, uh, one year following a deep plough. Um, so Ranscombe is in fact regarded as the only place where corn cockle does still occur in the wild in the UK. And uh, blue pimpernel on the bottom left is actually a subspecies of the much more common scarlet pimpernel, which you can see alongside it along the bottom. Um, and it's one, of, it's one of these things that's probably always been quite rare, its records have always been pretty sparse. And lastly, they're finally fumitory, another annual that is mainly restricted to southern and eastern England. Um, and this has also seen big declines due to agriculture intensification since the middle of last century and is now classified as vulnerable in the UK, which is the third highest level of uh, conservation concern. Um, but Ranscombe is also home to a very nice variety of grassland species, particularly those associated with chalk soils. Um, I'll just show you a few of them. So um, first off, uh, we've got Meadow Clary, which is one of our highlights, really. Now, the first place it was ever recorded in the whole UK was actually Ramsden Farm way back in 1699. Um, and we know that it was more widespread at Ranscombe even as uh, recently as back in the 1970s. But these populations were lost as the open grass and that it occupied gradually became scrubbed over with trees. And after that, it largely clung on in small patches on the chalk slopes between the woodland and one of the arable fields. Um, secondly, a plant that we're familiar to a lot of you, rock rose, which you get on chalk and limestone, depending on where in the country you are. Um, now, it's found in, in patches of ancient chalk grass at Ranskin, but also in areas of bare chalk around some of the arable fields. And although it is fairly widespread, it's actually a plant that's now classed as near threatened. Um, Burnet rose uh, is a plant very rare in Kent. Um, and elsewhere, it tends to occur on coastal dunes and cliffs rather than on the, uh, rather than on the grass as it does on uh, Ranscombe. Um, and then clustered bellflower, um, which is a very nice plant that flowers later in the season. Still flowering in autumn and September when most of the other grass and flowers have gone over. But it's a rare plant in Kent. Um, and, and close to where it occurs, you also get to the other species of the same name, um, hairbell and nettle leaf bellflower. 
there are at least 10 orchid uh, species found at Ranscombe, uh, which occupy a mixture of grass and land woodland habitats. Uh, now, by far the most common is pyramidal orchid, which occurs in thousands, but here are some of the most uh, notable ones, or the rows of uh, species of most conservation concern. So first we have fly orchid there, um, and this is an orchid that appears on chalk hills across southern England and on limestone in the north of England. It used to be common in East Anglia on calcareous fens, apparently, but largely died out when many of these were drained uh, about a century ago. Uh, man orchid is a species that's mainly concentrated on the North Downs. And again, it used to be a lot more common in East Anglia, but many of these populations have been lost over the decades. Um, and that's classified as endangered. Uh, lady orchid, again, predominantly on the North Downs, and it was perhaps never particularly common outside of Kent, actually. Um, and some populations existed on the Dow South Downs, but many of these have gone by about 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, and lastly, white helleborine another chalk-loving uh, chalk orchid in southern and uh, southeast England. It's a closely associated with beech trees. Uh, so why is the site so important? Well, we believe that a lot might have to do with the continuity in the landscape. Uh, and what we have here are two maps, one from 1797 and another one from near enough to the present day. And what I hope this shows you is... Um, is the is the continuity in the landscape over time and so yes there have been very obvious changes such as urban encroachment railways and roads and that but many of the features in the landscape remain unchanged um so a particular note is see me come off see my little cursor um particular note is this uh, woodland field and woodland boundary uh, along here just by the number 68 um which is a very distinctive pattern um and so you can see, and you can actually see that also on a map that goes back to 1641. You can make out a lot of the tracks of the woodland that still persist hundreds of years on, and it's no coincidence, I'm sure, that some of our most important plant species occur along or close to these old historic lines. And it's worth pointing out here that this area called Mill Hill, down in the bottom left, in, uh, in the south of the site, is a lot more heavily wooded today than it was in 1797. And what we see here is an area of probably former grazed chalk grass and that was either planted up or was abandoned and allowed to scrub over, eventually turning into woodland. So when plant life took over the site, it looked a bit like this. Um, now, the eagle-eyed among you will notice that Google Earth uh, image actually is from um, May 2007. But broadly speaking, most of the features that we can see at this scale were similar in 2007 to so how they had been two years earlier. Now worth pointing out here that the grey shaded area in the middle is where the old centre of Ranscombe Farm was, so they're now private residences, so this area has nothing to do with our management um, of the reserve, unfortunately. Um, now what I hope you can see from this image is that when Plata took the site on, it was very much an intensive arable farm. Um, you can see what appears to be a crop of rapeseed dominating, dominating much of the middle area um, and further arable cultivation down in the in the valley down there and on some of the southern slopes. Now the northern half of the site was occupied by this extensive area of ancient woodland which was itself part of the larger Cottonwood site of special scientific interest stretching further to the west and this woodland was chiefly made up of sweet chestnut coppice. Um, now, coppicing, as a lot of you probably know, is a traditional form of woodland management whereby trees are cut down at the base to obtain a crop of wood and allowed to regrow from the stump or stool, as we call it, which after, after however many years, depending on the tree species and what you're wanting to use the wood for, the stems are then cut again. Now, as the picture, uh, shown in the picture, you get multiple stems growing out from each stool, um, which will often grow straight and upwards where they're competing for the light. Uh, broadly speaking, you can continue this cycle indefinitely. Uh, many copy stools uh, can live to hundreds of years old. Um, but the trees we can see here with the, the ones that have been cut, um, they're sweet chestnut that have been cut around 25 years old. So uh, the sweet chestnut is not a tree native to Britain, which uh, and, and originally came from the Mediterranean. So um, not a, a problem necessarily, but they were planted en masse across woodlands all over the southeast to provide a crop of long straight poles used to grow hops for brewing beer. 
and ran at Ranska, most of the woodland at North of the site was probably converted to chestnut covers between about 100 and 200 years ago. Um, and from this picture that you can see in some areas, was chestnut is pretty much the only tree species. And although the market for hot pool poles has largely disappeared uh, in the middle of the last century, chestnut was still being copied for a range of products into the 1990s, including fencing materials and wood pole, typically on a cycle of 15 to 30 years. But by the time the plant life took over the site, the rate of cutting had slowed down significantly. And one of the key priorities for managing the woodlands at Ranskin was to get regular coppice going again. Um, at least we did, um, but as well as by having commercial contractors, we also cut and process a lot in house with our volunteers uh, for use of fencing stakes, among other things. Now, the importance of coppicing from a woodland conservation point of view is when an area of coppice is felled. There's a sudden influx of light to the woodland floor, which gives a boost to ground floor that's been lying dormant between coppice cycles. And as a coppice regrows, it goes through several different stages that provide habitat for variety of wildlife, from dormice to nightingales. Now, coppicing different areas of woodland in different years creates different patchwork and different habitats, so effectively the byproducts of this traditional management practice. Um, now at Ranscombe, as in much ancient wood on the top of the North Downs, bluebells do very well from this ongoing copper cycle, but it's worth pointing out that past the first few years of regrowth following coppicing, there isn't a great deal of diversity. Um, chestnut is a very fast growing tree with a dense foliage, which quickly shades out other trees and plants. And as an introduced species, its value for wildlife on its own in big monocultures is pretty limited. Um, so where much of the cotton woods area had been converted to chestnut coppice, there wasn't a great deal of diversity in terms of species or structure. Um, and you can make out these tracks through the woods, um, which have been a very narrow, uh, planted right up to the edges, creating very shady conditions. And relative to the area, there weren't an awful lot of mature trees in the woods. Um, and you can actually see individual oak trees um, dotted amongst the coppice in places. Um, the greatest concentrations of old and mixed growth were, were along what we call the town road through the middle here um, and along the old boundary that I mentioned earlier um, along the southern edge of the woodland. And uh, the town road is so cool because it was part of a route that formerly ran east crossing the river Medway to the city of Rochester. And some 200 years ago it was planted with the, this informal avenue of hornbeam trees. A species uh, already occurred naturally in which there are still several much older specimens surviving, some going back probably four or five hundred years. But hornbeam is a species that you don't see much outside of the southeast. And in fact, the local area, uh, the Cottonwoods area, is thought to have one of the best concentrations of veteran hornbeam in the country, if not Western Europe. Now, the woodland in the southern half of the site, occurring on the chalk slopes, tends to be much more mixed in character. Um, being made up of smaller woodland shores and including areas of ancient woodland, later planting and secondary woodland, areas that developed into woodland after open areas are gradually scrubbed over. And Mill Hill, down the bottom, is one such area containing a nice variety of woodland and scrub habitats. Um, and uh, as you can see here, it's also home to some rather nice beech trees, um, the white hellebrings that were um, mentioned earlier. And Mill Hill is one of the most uh, botanically rich parts of the reserves, um, so for the White Hellerings and lots of other orchids. Now, in terms of other land uses beyond commercial Arab land, there was some grassland here um, in an area of improved pasture on the deep southern slopes called the Knock that the farmer used for grazing cattle. But the only area of species rich grass on the reserve was a very small patch down at the southern east, uh, the southeastern end of Mill Hill. Um, right down there, a tiny bit down there. The remainder of what was probably much a larger expanse of chalk grass and it once extended all the way to the west until the middle of the 19th century. In terms of the rare arable plants, kitchen field there in the red was the only part of the site solely dedicated to them. And where they existed elsewhere on the site, these tended to be in small pockets around the edges of fields and would be occurring largely by accident rather than by design. And because of its known importance of rare arable plants, Hitchinfield had been subject to a management agreement between the farmer and uh, English nature, um, which is now Natural England, since 1985. And under this agreement, the farmer was required to cultivate the field like an arable field, 
but to use no fertilizers, not even organic fertilizers, and certainly no herbicides. So over winter, kitchen field would appear something like this. Um, so you can really see here how chalky the soil is, uh, which many of these arable plants are able to tolerate and so thrive on so very well. In some cases, it's hardly what you might really call soil at all, rather sort of bare chalk rubble, which again is perfect for many of the arable rarities. Uh, but come June, July time, um, this is what kitchen field uh, typically looks like in full flower. So you get this fantastic uh, brush of poppies. And there are five species of poppy occurring at Ranscombe, with common poppy being by far the most numerous um, and responsible for these colourful displays. Um, but uh, other years, kitchen field may feature fewer poppies and may be mainly white with stinking chamomile, which is another rare plant which performs the main ground cover over much of the field um, on occasion. But as well as this excellent visual display, many of the often smaller, rarer plants incur, occur in the uh, spaces in between. So having given you an overview of where we were in 2005, I'm going to skip forward 18 years to 2023 uh, and talk you through some of the key management activities that we have undertaken, uh, starting with what we've just been looking at, the arable plants. So the main focus of arable plant conservation in 2005 was kitchen field. A key priority early on, was, early on was to increase the area of land on the reserve that was managed for these plants. Now, there were other parts of the site that were very similar to kitchen field in terms of their soil and aspects and so on. And based on how well we know the seed of arable plants to remain viable in the soil, there was every reason to suggest that other parts of the reserve could be every bit as good. So we worked with the farmer to sign up to what was then called the High Level Stewardship Scheme, which was an environmental stewardship scheme for landowners run by Natural England that paid financial incentives for management undertaken for nature. Now, in the farmer's case, these incentives were really financial compensation as he was effectively taking land out of production in order to provide habitat for arable plants. However, there is some synergy in all this, broadly speaking. Um, if the land that is best for arable plants tends to be that on the steeper slopes with thin chalky soils which are hard to farm and require more cost in fertilizer in order to be productive whereas the more productive arable land tends to be on the flatter slopes with richer clay soils which in turn are not as good for the arable plants so it sort of balances itself out so fields such as long hose down in the bottom right um, and the area immediately below the north downs way um, and the uh, and the edge along the, uh, the valley there were at various points after 2008 taken entirely out of arable production. Now, um, now all of these are generally on, on the southern slopes are um, generally on steep south facing very chalky land. And I think I'd be right in saying that the farmer is probably happier being given a guaranteed payment to farm these in nature rather than having the physical and financial effort of getting a viable crop out of them. Um, now, that's not to say that he's paid for doing nothing, of course not. Um, the fields still need to be cultivated, and that, of course, takes time and effort. But what he's not doing in, in terms of that is applying fertilisers or herbicides, and that is what is allow the, allowing the arable plants to thrive. Um, and through the current scheme, um, so he's also been cultivated, uh, cultivated six metre wide margins around some of the commercial arable fields. Um, and these margins serve to provide nice flowery buffers around fields of crops, but also provide connectivity that allows plant seed to move between the large areas of conservation arable that we've got. So if we look back at some of the arable plants I mentioned earlier, I'll just tap through some of the impact that this management has had on them. Um, now the important thing to say, first of all, is that because these are annuals, their numbers fluctuate year on year based on all kinds of factors. So from time of year that cultivation was carried out um, to the type of cultivation, whether that was deep ploughing or visiting the surface, uh, and also dependent on local weather conditions. Now, narrow fruited corn salad in the top left, a plant that wasn't even in kitchen field originally, but instead clung on in small pockets along field edges, now appears regularly all the way through Longhouse Field and along other chalky slopes in the south of the reserve, often reaching population numbers in the tens of thousands. Um, and corncock on the top right, uh, which is 
uh, is now also well established in Longhouse Field, having been previously restricted to Kitchen Field, where we still see healthy numbers appearing. So the seed is heavier and less mobile, so it doesn't tend to spread as quickly as other plants, but it most likely moved to its new location in Longhouse Field on the wheels of the farmer's tractor a few years back. Um, and finally, fumitry in the bottom right uh, is a plant that has also much benefited from management in Longhouse Field, increasing its range from virtually nothing to often being present throughout the whole field. Um, and in some years appearing in many thousands as well. A blue pimpernel, bottom left, is an interesting case uh, as numbers of this have always been pretty low, apart from one particular year, which is 2012. And it responded very well to kitchen field being ploughed rather than this, and also being ploughed in the spring rather than the autumn. And then that following um, summer, over 7,000 plants that appeared. Um, but however, it hasn't been possible to replicate that success um, in subsequent years. Um, and also that year, that excellent year for Blue Pimpernel coincided with a bad year for corn cockle, uh, which didn't much appreciate the spring such cultivation. So it just goes to show that what, um, what is good for some things often isn't good for others. Um, and there's an awful lot to learn um, for us still about how these plants behave, what they prefer, um, and how you can provide more bespoke management um, for them um, but that's tricky in many ways trying to actually trying to uh, do a, a sort of a bespoke management for different parts of the field when you've got a tenant farmer who's delivering that management because it's far easier for them to do a whole field under one treatment rather than sort of divide bits up. Um, now a plant I haven't yet mentioned uh, is this one broadleaf cudweed uh, which now in 2005, it was thought that kitchen field alone was just that um, 10 acre field was home to 95% of the entire UK population of this UK endangered plant. Now, it certainly isn't the most stunning to look at, but nationally, this is, this is extremely rare. And it appears to seed prolifically, uh, and the seed is very mobile. So it quickly exploited lots of the new conservation arable habitat, and the population is regularly in the tens of thousands. He said it had been estimated to be in the millions some year, um, as in this uh, year in this picture. And you can see here that it forms the main ground cover. Um, it has occurred across most parts of the reserve now, in disturbed bare areas of grass as well, even in the woodland, in fact, um, which just goes to show how these plants don't differentiate across between habitat sites. If the conditions are right, then they will grow. Um, and also what is interesting about this, I think, is that actually for all of these species, what you're actually doing um, in manage to manage for them in practical terms isn't always that much. Um, you know, you're just providing the right the right conditions, and you know they they will often do their thing. Um, now, if you recall back in two thousand and five, the only areas of permanent grass in uh, that I mentioned were this area, this grazed field called the Knock down there, and the small patch at Mill Hill. And the small mill hill patch was very high quality, despite being small, with very high quality pieces of species rich chalk grass and containing plants such as horseshoe vetch, rock rose, man orchid, and even harebell. Now, this fragment was most likely once part of a much larger area of chalk grass and extending westwards. Now, much of this had from the mid 19th century been either planted with trees or been abandoned and scrubbed over, uh, developing into woodland, etc. Um, and similarly, an area at the top of uh, kitchen field up there um, that was by 2005 very much tree covered had also until the 1940s been open grass and scrub and in fact this was one of the previous sites where meadow clary had been meadow clary had been recorded in the 1970s again this area contained small fragment populations of rare and important plants and these plant populations were surviving in small pockets quite vulnerable to further declines with very little chance of increasing their range beyond. So what we did was to work to restore grass and in these areas, doubling the extent of the Mill Hill patch and more gradually recreating up to a couple of acres at the top of the kitchen field. Um, so here is Mill Hill with the original grass and on the left. Um, and the scrub that had been grown up since the 1940s um, on, on the right. We were already managing the existing patch of grass and by mowing at the end of the summer once the seed had set and raking up cuttings to prevent smothering and nutrient buildup in the soil. But we had evidence from old maps, photos, as well as 
first-hand anecdotal evidence that this area too was previously grass and in fact there were even a few non-flowering rosettes of man or poking through the ivy covered ground uh, in the scrub so we cleared the scrub felling the trees uh, using our team of volunteers and a contractor then got a machine in to grind the stumps out and scrape off the top layer of material all that accumulated ivy and leaf litter that would otherwise inhibit recolonization by grass and species now we did a similar thing at the top of the kitchen field only over a longer period of time. Um, and what is interesting here is that in the 1970s, the farmer had installed a rabbit fence along the top of the arable field. And where the area behind it scrubbed over, it developed into what was in effect a natural hedge. And after we cleared the scrub with the volunteers, we got a contractor in to grub out the fence and the tree stumps, effectively reconnecting the two parts of the kitchen field once more. And this created a this very nice, disturbed chalky strip along the front edge of the grassland which would have been home to all kinds of dormant plant seed um, which included this uh, ground pine which, in, and which is another endangered species and it's another annual that is well suited to chalky soil and it really benefited from this disturbance of the seed bank. Now the fence and scrub were grubbed out in early 2014 um, and in the summer of 2015, so the year after, around 150 ground pine plants will be found along this edge, having only just been a handful uh, before. Now, as well as restoring these smaller species rich fragments of grass, and we've also been starting to recreate much larger wildflower meadows. So um, we extended the reserve in 2010 by purchasing Brockles Field uh, in the southwest with money from our Heritage Lottery Grant and Medway Council. And through his stewardship scheme, we got the farmer to take both 20 acre field and part of Longhose field out of production and revert them back to grass. Now, Brockles had been an arable field up until the 1990s when it went into the set aside scheme that some of you uh, may remember from years back. In the years before Plant Life took it on, it gradually reverted to grass and the seed migrated in from the field edges and surrounding land but a grass that was still quite rich in nutrients due to its history of the fertilised arable field and also one that became easily overgrown with scrub. Brockles field incidentally is fantastic for um, skylarks. Then 20 acre and uh, the eastern end of Longhose were both abandoned, uh, were both abandoned as arable fields with the intention that they would recolonise naturally with grass and species rather than introducing important imported grass seed mixes, so acting a bit like Brockles did. 20 acre field was particularly important um, as meadow clary occurs along the top edge of that field uh, and creating more suitable grass and habitat here would provide a lot more security to the population and also create potential new habitat for it to spread into. However, these former arable fields would take a long time to become as good as the corresponding smaller fragments as they had long been managed as arable and would still contain a high concentration of nutrients. They're also reliant on the seed of grass and species finding their way in, which we ultimately want to achieve is for the assemblies of plants in those small species rich pockets to spread into these newer, larger areas of grass and where there is a the potential to establish really big, robust populations. Um, now, this is unlikely to be something that happens without active intervention. In Mill Hill, there are little populations of grass and species uh, dotted along a series of uh, glades through the woodlands, such as patches, patches of horseshoe vetch halfway up. But these haven't really increased their range at all over the years. So to try and kickstart this colonisation, we've been employing the use of um, green hay spreading. Now, green hay spreading is a fairly standard med, uh, meadow creation or restoration technique. And we, here we have our volunteer team moving, uh, moving and then uh, raking off the cuttings. In this case, at the top of the kitchen field at the end of the summer, once the grass and flowers have set, so the cuttings uh, can be collected in the builder's bags and then taken up to the new meadow site in the trailer where they're unloaded and the material spread thinly over the recently cut field, uh, where the seed will then drop and hopefully establish. Uh, I mean, I'm only really skimming over meadow creation, but by the way, and plants have a lot more resources available that you can uh, look into if you want to know more. Um, since we started this back in 2017, the results have been uh, really quite promising, though it takes a good couple of years, if not more, before you start to see the new plants flowering. In fact, a uh, cluster bellflower appeared in Brockles Field only last summer for the first time as a result of that first green hay experiment 
in 2017. Um, so, it, but, it, but it did work. Um, <laughs> it's also quite labour intensive. So there is a limit to how much plant material you can realistically move uh, and, and fitting it in the right time windows and so on. You don't want to leave it too long after you cut it. Um, though hopefully what will happen is that once the new populations have become established, then these will themselves increase their range naturally within the new grass if the, if the conditions are correct. So what will hopefully provide a much more self-sustaining, reliable method of moving seed without grazing. Um, and grazing is a key part of managing these big new areas of grasslands anyway. Um, and grazing animals, of course, being natural lawn mowers. But before we established a water supply and fencing in brockles fields to enable cattle grazing, we had the whole 60 acres cut mechanically. Um, and this is very expensive as the field was very scrubby with no value as a hay crop. And so cutting really is not a cost, of, a cost effective form for, of, of management for us. Um, but there are many other benefits to grazing over mowing beyond simply the cost. Um, and when they graze cattle, of course, they provide a variety, a, a varied sward at different heights and densities, providing lots of different habitat niches for plants, birds, mammals, and, and invertebrates. And importantly, cattle poach up the ground where they walk, creating patches of bare ground, providing niches in which some of the rarer chalk grass and plants are able to set seed. And of course, there are other ecological benefits from the cattle um, provided by their manure. And of course, the cattle have an economic value as livestock. So they ultimately pay for themselves being there. Um, now, a farmer owns the cattle, um, and these obviously then go into the uh, food chain. So we started grazing Brockholm's field in um, 2013. Uh, this has since been divided into three different um, grazing departments. So we can control the time a bit more and keep parts of the field ungrazed during the summer months when everything uh, is flowering. We then introduced grazing to the 20 acre field. Um, but then we undertook further funding projects to get grazing into kitchen field as well, both the restored grass at the top and the conservation arable too. Now, the reason for grazing the arable is that once everything is finished flowering and set seed, grazing is again a good tool for controlling some of the invasive perennial weeds um, that we don't want, the grasses and so on, otherwise would need to be sprayed off with chemicals. Um, so importantly, what we what we had now was a connected system of graze fields that we could move the cattle between. We start to create these important ecological linkages across the site as the animals move seed about on their coats and on their feet. In addition, a local charitable trust were, also, were able to get hold of um, some project funding to fence another restored species chalk, uh, species rich chalk arson just outside the reserve, a remnant of what was much. Uh, a, a much larger area of open grass and called Warren Plain um, over to the west and we could link directly here uh, from here to Brockles and the cattle can now move freely between the two for a few weeks in the autumn. And lastly to connect the original bit of grazing land but not to all the other grazing land we had this fenced drove uh, installed which allowed the animals to be driven right across the reserve helping to create further ecological links and also making all of our jobs a lot easier uh, moving the cattle between the fields. So, and then, yeah, and then the final bit there in the valley, which is something that we're looking to do um, in the next, um, well, imminently. Um, so here with the, uh, the cattle moving between Brockwood Field and Warren Plain, um, and these are mainly Sussexes and Angus, um, Farmer mainly has native breed cattle at Ranscombe that are happy to living outdoors and happy surviving on rougher pasture, um, including a lot of the scrub that we've got in Brockles. Now, the drove route I mentioned um, actually continued beyond the fence section of the link, uh, the links field together. Um, we had a we had a digger scrape off the top floor to width of about five metres uh, for about 300 metres along the northern edge of the 20 acre field. And this replicated the sort of tracks that herd animals often create when they move about. And the idea was to generate bare chalk habitat that would be good for annual plants. And as you can see, the cattle have been walking up and down um, over the winter um, and really poaching it up. And the area immediately above the drove is home to one of our meadow fairy populations. And it's hoped that in time, this drove may benefit the spread of this species. But the drove has already been very productive, actually, with broadly cudweed. Um, appearing along it, more of that, um, and also uh, this plant, which is rough mallow, 
um, which is another chalk loving annual and it occurs in several locations across the reserve it likes a disturbance um, and often once conditions become sedentary and grass, o- grass over it, it tends to disappear so the sort of regular annual disturbance created by this cattle drive is probably just what it needs for sustaining the population now incidentally rough mallow is another plant that like meadow clary was first ever recorded in the uk at ranskin farm only about 100 years later in 1792. Now, a network of grass margins has also been established around many uh, of the commercial arable fields. Um, again, through the farmer stewardship scheme, you typically seek six metres wide, like the conservation arable margins, they're left and sprayed to act as buffer strips to support a range of wildlife, um, particularly in that zone between the farmed arable land and woodland edge. They are on the whole less important for rare plant species, as many are located on the rich clay soil but are very good for producing healthy populations of nectar rich plowing plants that support lots of insects, particularly bees, um, which Ranscombe is uh, very good for. So what has this work for grassland achieved? Um, well, one way we could assess this is by looking at change in population of man orchid over the past um, 13 years, or 12 years, technically speaking. Um, and we can see that in 2010, uh, there were 85 plants in grass at the top of kitchen field, 85 man orchids maximum recorded. Um, now, initial scrub clearance was carried out in 2005, then more extensively between 2010 and 2014. Um, then grazing was introduced from 2015, and the plants have responded um, well there. Um, by 2022, the maximum number of man orchids only been recorded um, since 2007 almost trebled to, to 237. Now at Mill Hill down the bottom, and there were far fewer plants um, that only there were only seven originally, um, and the ongoing management of the chalk grass and there, and, um, and the over doubling in habitat size has, has again led to a significant increase in population, which on twenty six plant. Also, the population down in the car park, down the bottom right, has also steadily increased with regular cutting the chalk bank where they occur there. So we certainly see an upward trend in overall population size in the places where man orchid was already occurring. But what about it spending about it expanding their range into the new areas of grass that I was talking about? Well, for the first time in 2020, um, during the COVID uh, spring, uh, we recorded 39 new man orchid plants in Brockles Field. Um, and it's impossible to know exactly how these have been brought in, um, but uh, whether by green hay spreading or whether it was removed by the wind or the action of grazing cattle or whatever. But by 2022, the population had increased 154. So importantly, there, were, there clearly is now suitable habitat in Brockles Field and a small but nonetheless robust population has been established there. And there's every reason to suggest based on how man orchids increased elsewhere at Ranscombe and indeed on evidence from other known graze sites locally that these could continue to spread within suitable habitat in Brockles and ultimately go on to become by far the main population on the reserve, you know, potentially sort of thousands of plants. As for man orchid in uh, 20 acre, well, we haven't seen it there yet, but it may simply be that we just haven't found it. Um, or that you know hasn't been spotted, or you know that it just hasn't found its way there. Um, what we haven't yet attempted, and what uh, is on the do list, is to try spreading green hay from the um, car park population into long host field. Um, now, lastly, I'll just talk to you about what we've been doing with regards to the woodlands at Ranscombe. Now, I explained earlier how uh, up to two thousand five, much of the woodland in the northern reserve was very shady. Where only tree uh, where trees were coppiced, uh, only where trees were coppiced did you get much light into the woods, and that tended to be fairly temporary as the trees grow back rapidly. There were very few permanent open areas within the woods, and this was significantly limiting the diversity of both plants and other wildlife. Um, so what we have done is effectively widened a lot of the woodland tracks uh, or rides as we call them by felling trees to a width of up to thirty meters in places, and also opening up new glades and this creates a network across the woodland connecting to other open habitats such as grassland and arable field edges 
in many cases, we have brought in large machinery to grind out the stumps in order to create a clear surface to the rise that allow them to be mown and kept open permanently. Um, and you can see here uh, as an example uh, before and after shot. So this is pretty much the same view. Um, the left was taken in 2010, just before the area was opened up, and the right um, pretty much the same position in about 2017. So on the right, you can see where the chestnut coppice has been pushed right back after felling and following the work to remove the stumps. It's gradually recolonized with grasses and other plants. Um, now, the unmown back edge has been allowed to scrub up naturally with self sown birch and willow, and there is now space for these uh, mature oak trees um, that have previously been suffocated by the surrounding chestnut coppice as you can uh, see with the one where a lot of the crown died back uh, on the left. In a fairly short space of time, we can also see much greater variety uh, in the structure of the woodland. Now, while on the whole, there are perhaps fewer plant species of high conservation concern as compared with the arable and grassland, what we have seen in creating these wide varieties is a massive increase in the more common plant species. So many of these varieties, particularly in the early stages of the development, before they get very grassy, uh, are soon colonised by large numbers of wild strawberry on the left uh, and violets. Um, and other species such as nettle bellflower, uh, marsh thistles and primroses all do very, very well along these varieties, providing good nectar sources for insects. In fact, as many of you may know, that uh, violets are the um, plant that silverwash fertility butterflies lay their eggs on. Um, and the, we first spotted silver wash fritillary uh, at the top there back in, two, in 2011. And since then, the numbers of these wooden specialists have rocketed. And they're now a common sight flying up and down all these rides in July every year. And likewise, the White Admiral um, down the bottom there uh, is also um, made a welcome return in response to our uh, management work. It's a very regular feature. Um, now, another way we've been trying to improve the diversity of the woodland has been to copy back many of our wooden edges um, along a total of over six kilometres. So instead of having a hard edge of tall trees growing right up against the field, we tend to create very shady conditions and leave very little light for any undergrowth. We're going to develop something more, more like this. Um, and what I hope it shows is the development of dense scrub a few years following um, edge coppicing. The edge now consisting of a wide range of species with a varied structure which should <laughs> be good for nesting birds and small mammals. This is also carried out in conjunction with management um, of, many, uh, of many of the field edges which are left uncut so the bramble undergrowth can actually spread out from the woodland to create habitat that is excellent for species such as harvest mice is what we found. Um, and along some of the edges on chalky soils, it's often less brambly, but you can get really nice waves of plants like these small scabious. Now, in the ancient woodlands, uh, in the uh, cotton woods, the ancient woods in the, in the north, uh, there were just a few concentrations of mature and veteran trees. Um, as I said earlier, the, the, the town road and the section of the southern edge of the woods um, with those dotted lines. Um, Others were fairly sparsely dotted around the woods, mainly long um, tracks and edges. And we started to connect up these areas by being beginning to convert whole areas of chestnut coppice back into mixed species woodland. Um, now I say back, uh, as of course the chestnut was only planted up some 200 years ago. So this is probably returning to something more akin to what it once was. Uh, we don't know exactly what it was, but um, it's something that's more, um, going to, to make it something that's more, more diverse. Now, to do this, uh, what we've been doing is actually controlling the chestnut coppice regrowth after felling and allowing other trees to recolonize naturally, which includes a wide range of species, including oak, hornbeam, hawthorn, holly, goat, willow, birch, and haze, and so on. Um, so, across all these areas, Mott Brown, we started this process. And as you can see, these are integrated with the, with the woodland ride and glade network, but they also tie into some of the botanically richest areas of the woodland. So the area to the east, for example, is one of our key areas for, uh, for lady orchid. And here we can see this particular area of the woods in its early stages. Uh, and hopefully you can see here that um, where these, um, the old chestnut stools, the stools have been killed off in this area uh, and some of the new growth that is now colonising the area. And within these little guards um, uh, and actually regenerating oak saplings. Um, and then in comparison there would be the very uniform chestnut coppice behind um, with some older mature trees that are still um, remnants of, of the past. Um, 
Now, I mentioned Lady Orchid being present in, present in this uh, area of the woods. Now, a key part of the management to increase tree diversity is also to create a much greater variety of structure as well as species with different tree species growing at different rates that we can um, so that we can see on the right. Now, this replaces the very rapid and uniform regrowth of chestnut coppice on the left. Um, and will in turn hopefully support a wider range of woodland plant species as well as providing habitat for birds such as nightingale, which has actually been recorded singing around school again in recent years. And a long-term goal of this work, uh, restructuring work, of course, is also to create a whole new generation of mature veteran trees, particularly oak, um, which is a simple floor there's, there's um, relatively fewer of uh, for the size of the woods. Um, we've been working to halo a lot of the existing oak trees such as here, so that um, that's clearing around, reduce the suffocating effects of being surrounded by um, coppice. But what we would like to see is a wooden, much more dominated trees like this in the future. Um, but of course, we have to accept that regardless of the work we do now, that is, of course, something that uh, none of us will ever, ever get to see. Um, now, just to finish uh, this, this presentation, I'll just quickly summarise the main activities that we have undertaken at Ranscom since 2005 um, and that brings us up to where we are now. So just to summarise there, we still have at Ranscom this uh, central core of a very productive commercial arable farmland in, in the centre. Um, but much of this is bounded by grass buffer strips to enhance the wildlife diversity. Um, but in the south of the site particularly, on the chalk slopes, there is a large um, proportion of former arable land um, that like the original kitchen field in the West uh, is now dedicated solely to the conservation of arable plants. And also on the chalk, there are large areas of grassland under restoration, now integrated with the older historic species rich pieces of grassland. And then grazing is then used as a tool to manage its habitats and further enhance the dynamics across the landscape, helping to, to move plant seed about and so on, whilst also generating a product in outdoor reared beef cow. Um, then the woodland, much of which is still coppice and generates a financial return, is gradually becoming more and more diversified um, through creating a network of wildlife rich, um, permanently open habitat, and by converting areas of chestnut coppice back into mixed broadleaf woodland. Um, and we have already seen a lot uh, of very positive results from this management so far, um, but relatively speaking, it's still only very early days. I know someone. Uh, a while back, um, probably about 2009 or something, someone told me that it takes about 15 years, he said, to get a nature reserve going from when you start. Now, I didn't really know what he meant um, or where he got that number from, or he picked it from out of the air or something. But, but actually, funny enough, following that period of time, uh, it's funny, in the last few years, um, we have really started to see some big changes taking part as the effects of the management to date are now fully kicking in. So we are seeing sort of these new man orchids appearing in, in brockles and the numbers going up and so on. Um, things like lady orchid, for instance, that's a plant which from the moment of the, uh, I, I think it's something like it can take between the, the plant actually setting seed and, and a, a new plant, vegetative plant appearing can be something like seven years. So you've got that huge time lag of where you can start be doing the management and then the actual results don't kick in until I think it's some while. So you've got you've got time you have to wait to to sort of reap the rewards. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully we can see now that uh, you know these things are now gaining momentum of their own. So hopefully we'll be seeing much more in the future uh, and seeing um, Ranskin going uh, from strength to strength. So that brings me to the end. Um, and if anyone would like uh, i believe there's some time some questions if anyone wants to throw any at me <laughs> thank you very much ben that <laughs> was really interesting and uh, i must just jump in and say uh, apologies if i i suddenly drop off but my laptop battery seems to be dying but so it's nothing personal <laughs> but um if, if people want to visit the site are there yeah of, um, <laughs> through the... that would have to be <laughs> sorry yeah, the, I, there was too much to talk about in terms of the management and all that. I've completely skipped over um, the fact that, yes, there are, um, there are, it's publicly accessible. There's about 
10 miles of paths um, that, that, that can be that can be accessed. So, yeah, there's a car park down the bottom, as I mentioned, uh, smart to cover with, and there's about, ooh, there's about only about 10 different entrances from around the perimeter. Um, but yeah, there's on the on our website, there's, there's I think map, accessible map, the you know, maps that are accessible. But if if not, then I can easily send something over to you otherwise. But yeah, sorry, that was my fault. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't no, 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 way, no way. That. It, it, I mean, th that that image you got up on the screen at the moment, those field of poppies. I mean, I want to see that. So that, yeah, that, yeah, that's good to hear. Thank you very much for a absolutely fascinating talk. That was really brilliant. No problem at all. Thank you very much for having us. See you all uh, next month.